Mark and Luke, thank you so much for, for being on the podcast. And when I saw your book, Refuge Reimagined, it actually triggered me, like the title. Oh. And the reason why is about 15 years ago, I was at a church, a very loving church, had a wonderful pastor. But one of the topics that kept coming up again and again was the pastor's opposition to illegal immigration and his problems with overall American policy on immigration. And it became one of those issues that kept coming up again and again from the pulpit and was also addressed like in the church bulletin. And it got to the point for me where I was um, starting to have a hard time even worshiping. Like I'd come to the service prepared to worship. And I opened up the church bulletin to kind of read through announcements. And I'd see like almost an editorial on immigration, which upset me for a variety of reasons. And I got to the point where I couldn't even come to worship God. Like I couldn't even focus on the hymns, the reading of the catechisms and the creeds, because I was so disheveled and so upset. So I ended up, you know, having a talk with my pastor, ended up meeting, I was at a Presbyterian church. I ended up meeting with the elders and had a very, like a wonderful heart to heart conversation with them just to express my frustration. And that combined with a lot of other things ended up, my family left that church after 15 years. Mm -hmm. And so the topic of immigration, how to treat immigrants and refugees, like this topic for me has been very triggering. So when I saw your title, it brought back a flood of memories. Like, oh my gosh, 15 years ago, I dealt with this. And I was like very concerned, like how you'd be approaching this topic because it is so polarizing. And people separate over this issue. And there's so many divisions as Christians on how we how we talk about immigration. And I got to tell you, like, I fell in love with the way that you talked about this issue. You wrote about it, your biblical exegesis, the way you dressed um, the theological implications, um, how you talked about how people should be feeling about it, how the church should be dealing with it, how nations and then the globe like the way that you kind of outlined it was just a, I thought you did a beautiful job kind of expressing it. But I wanted to start off just by sharing that story with you. Thank you. Um, because I feel like um, sometimes this topic, just by seeing your book, your title can be like, oh my gosh, where, where are they going with this? Right. The Refuge Reimagined Biblical Kinship and Global Politics. We, it was written by us to unfold biblical justice. And so we're not politically partisan but the bible expresses god's heart when it comes to people who are on the move and seeking a home and so um we believe that it's our responsibility to, as evangelicals or as christ followers to to read scripture and understand god's heart regarding forced displacement and what was fascinating to me about your story is i just i have so many friends and i think millennials but even generation x is like the three people on this call have that it's been a real block for between them and church and them and faith. The way that there's been sometimes, even one might even say a, a certain callousness and uh, perhaps lack of creativity or lack of just deep and genuine biblical exploration when it comes to, to responding to forced displacement, whether it's refugee issues or immigration. I just had a, a question for you, Mike. What, what kind of reasons did your pastor give, even from Scripture, for his frustration with, or say, so-called illegal immigration. Yeah, and and this was the where it became. I think for my pastor, and again, um, amazing man of God. Like I have the utmost respect for him and the way that he's pastored me uh, through all those years. I, I love him, but um, it became like a moral issue around like Romans thirteen or those passages that talked about obeying your governing authorities and the government. Basically, the laws that are instituted by the government kind of instituted by God, like that kind of analogy, so that we obey the laws of the land because that ultimately is law that is given by God in, this, in the sense that God's given us these governing authorities to help police us, right, to rein us in. So it was like a moral issue for him. Yeah, we, we you know, I'm based in Australia and you hear the same verses used and the same arguments made to justify Australia's appalling um, policies toward refugees. There's a, a Bible study group that, that um, 
that r- runs Bible studies in Washington, D.C., called Capital Ministries. And they have a uh, Bible study within the uh, White House during, during the Trump administration. For the past four years, they had a Bible study, study running, and members included the Vice President, the Secretary of State, Attorney General, a whole bunch of um, incredibly influential people. And in 2016, and then again in 2019, the um, Capital Ministries, who run these Bible studies, ran a study on what does the Bible say about America's illegal immigration problem, was the title of the study. And it, it's basically they conjure up a mandate for the Trump's Trump administration's immigration policies from Scripture, resting heavily on Romans 13. And... Um, kind of making two uses of it, one which is just uh, a complete misreading of the words in the first uh, five or six verses of Romans 13 by uh, drawing out of those verses some spurious claim that those verses are about borders and are about boundaries of political community and that those verses say that the government has to prioritise citizens over foreigners, which, of course, um, is not to be found anywhere in those verses. And I've found, um, really, tragically, even even Christians who are arguing for a better way seem to take for granted that Romans 13 says that kind of thing. They say, well, yes, of course, Romans 13 says the government needs to prioritise the needs of citizens, um, but we can also uh, care for foreigners. Um, and so that's a, that's a disastrous use of the Bible to start with. But then um, the more understandable reading of Romans 13 that's also included in this Bible study run within the White House during the Trump administration is this idea that um, people must submit to those in authority. And and, uh, uh, the Attorney General Jeff Sessions used some of the language from this Bible study in a speech that he he gave soon after, um, where he's just telling church leaders uh, that uh, potential immigrants and Christians who are supporting potential immigrants need to obey the rules of the state because the state isn't a church. It's not our place to be um, good Samaritans. It's our place is to enforce the laws. And you need to tell your people within your churches to enforce, uh, to uphold these laws, to not break these laws and not to encourage other people to break these laws, especially illegal immigrants. Perhaps Mark might um, come in here with uh, some, some reasons for why that's a, an absolutist reading of those verses is problematic. Right. So in Refuge Reimagined, we show how we speak about Romans 13, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, and we show how Romans 13 comes in the context of Paul's epistle to the Romans, hot on the heels of Romans chapter 12, which is the well-known verse, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And so we're discerning the spirits of our age in light of God's revealed will. And Romans 12 goes on to unfold for us what is a Christian ethic, what is God's good and perfect will, revealed in, revealed in the Old Testament, the Torah, the law, the prophets, in the Gospels, and in Paul's teaching it themselves. From verse 9 of chapter 12, Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with family affection. Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Verse 16, don't be proud, but associate with the lowly. Verse 20, if your enemy is hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink, for by so doing you will burn your heat burning coals on their head. The point is that we need to read Romans 13 in light of the the Pauline call to discern the will of God in the context of an idolatrous culture. And there are uh, idols in American culture, Canadian culture where I live, and Australian culture where where Lewin lives. And some of these idols are a selfish nationalism. Some of these idols are a a heavily militarized nationalism or a borderized nationalism. What would it mean to transform and conform our will to God's will uh, that's revealed in scripture that includes associating with the lowly, that includes loving our enemies, that includes offering hospitality. So over the course of this hour, of course, we will uh, unfold 
that ethic of how we should respond to people seeking a home throughout the whole biblical story. But for now, as we look at Romans 13 and the call to submit to authorities, we need to put it in that Pauline context where Paul has this tender ethic that we always see in Je- also see in Jesus. But yet, what do we do with Romans 13, 1 to 5, with this call to submit to authorities? And it's important to put that in the context of the biblical story, of Paul's own life and of Jesus' own life. I mean, we know that, that Paul broke the rules time and time again. <laughs> And Jesus himself broke the rules time and time again. Uh, The apostles in the book of Acts, in but whether it's Jesus or the apostles in Acts or Paul himself, none of them are calling for, they're they're resisting very explicitly uh, a posture of the church as trying to overthrow the Roman Empire or is outrightly disobedient. And yet with the phrase, the kingdom of God is proclaiming a completely different rule in the face of Caesar. So it's a subversive challenge. To Caesar's authority. Now we know, of course, that Paul, in the end, um, was killed, executed in Rome, in the context right there in the heart of the empire, for preaching the gospel, which by various the rule of various authorities, including Jewish, uh, was illegal. Uh, Jesus himself, of course, was crucified for for great complexities, but but. In the end, a, a big part of it would have been Jewish leaders' fear over a, what seems to be like a, a factious tradition of Roman rule. Let alone the Old Testament. If you look uh, at, at, at the lives of people like Daniel, who there, in the thrall of Persian rule, lived subversively, uh, both in harmony with, but also challenging the direct command of Nebuchadnezzar not to pray. And so when Paul says, Submit to the authorities, he's describing a very complex and multicolored posture of Christians who have our first allegiance to the reign of God in Christ. Relation then to the authorities in the whole biblical story, including for Paul, for Christ, and Old Testament authors, is one that's complex and nuanced. We're not called to a militant overthrow, but we are called to proclaim a different rule. And at times that will mean uh, living in tension uh, with, with laws. And similarly, to be living in solidarity with those who may disobey a law uh, in order for their own survival. But we need to get into uh, uh, an ethic of welcoming the stranger in more detail. That would be a brief kind of answer, yeah, to that understandable um, hesitation of your former pastor, Mike. Like I said, like reading that first chapter especially helped to build a good framework for me help me understand the Romans 13 passage and how it can be applied and also sometimes the misuse of governing authorities in in creating laws that are actually hurtful to society. So you provide like a wonderful framework in that very first chapter that addressed my concerns with Romans 13 because what was triggering me tr- triggering to me also was like not only what my pastor was saying but also the scriptures because I was thinking about all the laws that I saw that I felt felt were unjust, unethical. And so I thought your first chapter, like going in was very healing to me to kind of hear how you were kind of approaching Romans 13, how you kind of dealt with it. And then as you begin to introduce this biblical ethic of kinship and what that means, and then bringing together uh, that mosaic of different passages and scriptures talking about how Israel and how the church should be treating the foreigner, the sojourner. So can you uh, maybe begin to share a little bit about what led you to actually actually develop this ethic? Yeah, I was writing my first book, which was a PhD um, on Old Testament ethics from the book of Deuteronomy, and particularly Deuteronomy's response to the stranger. And that's published in a book called Adopting the Stranger as Kindred in Deuteronomy. Fairly technical book. It's not the kind of book that, you know, you give away at parties, you know, and um and, you know, it, it could be even uh, be excused for being a little dull for those who aren't really into Hebrew language. But, but you know, what I was doing was I was just, I was thinking, what is the center of this? You know, we, ever, probably many people on this call know a diversity of laws to do with, say, you might call it biblical justice. You know, the gleaning laws, you know, leaving, leaving the residue of the harvest. People know certain uh, laws concerning forgiveness of debt and Deuteronomy 5, 4, there should be no poor among you. We all know these beautiful, this beautiful ethic. But I was, I was just hunting 
we're just trying to open and listening for a center. Like these ancient people who were reading and receiving these laws, how did they hear them? And I was trying to I was trying to discern that. And once you know, I live in Vancouver. And once I took a five hour flight over to Toronto to take a wedding, and I thought, okay, on this trip, I'm just gonna really listen, you know? I remember sitting in a cafe and thinking, and just thinking, I've got to read cultural anthropology about kinship because it has something to do with family. It has something to do with solidarity. And somehow in my individualistic, I brought up in Australia, live in Canada, Western context, and my particular experience of nuclear family and a fairly kind of deep individualism, I'm missing something that these ancient Hebrews were living with, right? And so I started to read cultural anthropology of ancient communal cultures or communal cultures even today. And I just started to get a sense of the call of sol- the experience of solidarity and communal identity that people in communal cultures have both then and today. And I started to realize that what we see in the Old Testament, when we see poverty in the Old Testament, when we see a call to embrace a stranger or to feed those who don't have food, it's addressing a crisis of solidarity. As an Australian Canadian, I read it as charity, but for communal cultures, it's about solidarity. If someone's hungry, it's a crisis of solidarity. It's not a crisis of social welfare. It's a crisis of kinship. If someone is enslaved and mistreated, for the biblical writers, it's a crisis of kinship. They should be enfolded as family. If someone uh, is living in your area, doesn't have enough food, and God says, leave them the gleaning for the fields, it's really saying you have a responsibility to enfold them like a familiar responsibility toward them. This isn't charity. This is sharing what God has given with a certain common identity. Because, And the reason is this is what you do for family. With family, you share. With outsiders, you don't. And so when it, because of this principle, with families we share, with outsiders, you don't, in the ancient Mediterranean world, when the Bible says share, it really is code for saying enfold them as family. When the Bible says welcome a stranger, it's really code for saying enfold them as family. You know, when the Bible says there should be no poor among you, for this ancient Mediterranean communal culture, that's really saying, hey, treat one another as family. This is a crisis of solidarity. And your brother and sister isn't just a person who, you know, you happen to be living with in the same house, but I, as the God who gives generously, is causing, is asking you and requiring you as the God who has embraced you as family, as your divine kinsperson, to embrace one another, especially the vulnerable. And this is a beautiful thing, Mike. This is a beautiful thing about biblical ethics. Whether it's Old or New Testament, it always tilts towards vulnerability. Mm. It always tilts towards embracing and folding the outsider as family. And why? Because this is the character of God. You see it in the Exodus event, where God chooses and emancipates this enslaved nation a people group of nobodies, and God makes them family, carries them on eagle's wing. And then what happens when you get to Sinai, or what happens when they receive the law, is all of a sudden God is, is creating this family, this community, this nation indeed, to be a community that's beautiful, that's living as God designed humanity to live in community with one another in the first place, in a nutshell, as kin. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, and I also love that in that first section of your book, you focus in a good, good look at Christ and the kinship as revealed in Christ. And I was wondering, like, are there any specific stories or verses that relate to the life of Christ where we see this ethic of kinship, like, greatly revealed? Sure. I mean, I'll jump in. Um, I mean, this is Mark speaking here. And, and when we start to apply it to the nation, the global community, Luke is going to have a lot more to say than me. To be sure, um, that you know, I've just described the heart of Torah very, very briefly in terms of this uh, by, by referring to some laws and by, by putting this in the frame of an ethic of kinship. And what we sometimes, when we come to the Gospels, we come to the life of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we sometimes make the mistake of thinking that Jesus invented all this stuff <laughs> in the sense that when we come to the Gospels, this is the first time we see this beautiful life, this Jesus way. You know, it's the first time, you know, this beatitude is sort of a completely new invention. Well, well, it's not. Jesus was being what Israel was always called to be. Jesus, the king in David's line, was fulfilling what Israel was called to be and to do. I mean, Israel was exiled at the end of the Old Testament story 
for her fa their failure to, to be this community of flourishing, especially for the weakest among them, for their practices of syncretism in worship, which seem to go hand in hand with this injustice. And so when Jesus comes, he, you know, Matthew and Luke explicitly narrate Jesus' genealogical identity as a king in David's line. And Jesus, when he proclaims the kingdom of God, uh, so in Mark uh, chapter 1, the beginning of the gospel, Mark 1, 14, 15, Jesus begins his ministry proclaiming the kingdom of God. He's proclaiming God's sovereign saving rule coming in his person and work. And this is, of course, uh, is the fulfillment of, uh, of the Old Testament story, a fulfillment of God, what God was calling and shaping God's people to be in the Old Testament times. When Jesus started to proclaim the kingdom of God that has come near in his person and work, Jesus is saying, now at last, we, in my person, in this moment, God's reign is coming. And what does it look like? It looks beautiful. And so, for example, you see in Jesus' meals, Jesus is eating with all the wrong people and becoming family around the table with all the wrong people. You think, for example, of Luke 15, 1 and 2, where the Jewish elite are charging Jesus, this man befriends sinners and tax collectors and eats with them. Mm. Well, again, to go to cultural anthropology, they show us that we become kin, we become family around table. And Jesus was doing nothing less than, than gathering around himself the eschatologi eschatological people of God, gathering around himself a remnant. And how was he doing that? By eating and teaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God. And he was doing it by gathering a makeshift family with all the, inverted commas, wrong people, but, of course, in the mind and heart of God, the right people. And so we see at Jesus' table fellowship, if you like, uh, the, we see in Jesus' table fellowship the fulfillment of this beautiful vision that we've briefly glimpsed at in the Old Testament. But an interesting place to go, I mean, just to, to really embed this, um, say, in the, in the present issue of immigration and refugees. I mean, Luke, you might want to talk about, for example, the Good Samaritan from Luke 11. And Luke, how might that, you know, relate to immigration and refugee issues and sort of, yeah, unpack Jesus' ethic via that parable of the Good Samaritan? Yeah, yeah. So we, we, um, we, we think with that parable in a few different ways in the book. One way that um, we think with the parable is to uh, deal with the issue that um, is often mentioned by theologians and, and other Christians and um which is this idea that, well, if you if you read this parable, it seems like the Good Samaritan only helps the wounded man that he happens upon by the side of the road. Um, so there's nothing in this this Good Samaritan parable that suggests that we need to be going out of our way looking for uh, people in need. Um, there's nothing that suggests certainly that we need to be looking beyond our borders for vulnerable people in need. We um, we act like the Good Samaritan by simply um, doing justice and, and loving those uh, that we don't know who we come across within our communities. Um, and uh, and that, as I say, that's quite a common reading. It's, it's not the only reading that's found through history, um, obviously. Um, Augustine took this parable um, and immediately said, well, this is, this is calling for the universal love of people. Uh, he, he wasn't kind of restricting it to questions of geographical proximity, but others have. Um, but we um, we find it useful to, to we, we, we can respond to that uh, in, in various ways. One, by pointing out that today, whatever may have been the case uh, for, for those uh, at various points over the past 2,000 years who offered that kind of limited geographical proximity kind of argument, today we're aware of the suffering of people unknown to us on all parts uh, of the globe. Um, and, and so there's no sense in which we can say we, we, we don't know of the suffering of, of Syrians fleeing civil war and fleeing atrocities. We don't know of the suffering of Rohingya who've been displaced from Myanmar. We don't know of the suffering of, of uh, millions of uh, people in Yemen or South Sudan or, or Venezuela who've had to flee or are internally displaced. Uh, and so that's not really an excuse if we want to think um, with the Good Samaritan in a um, genuine way. But also the Good Samaritan parable, I think, prompts us to see that, well, if we understand, therefore, that our states 
Our countries so often fail to act like the Good Samaritan in caring for those that they know they're vulnerable uh, and, and have a capacity to care for but fail to do so. It's, it's, that's not the, uh, the end point in thinking with this parable because when we think about it a bit more deeply, it turns out our states actually also act like the priest and the Levite in all kinds mm. of ways, crossing to the other side of the road in a sense to avoid mm. having to confront uh, the reality of this suffering as our states detain uh, in detention centres those who come to our borders appealing for asylum and help, or as we deter them in various ways, deter them from even trying to come to our borders by punishing those who do get to our borders and detaining them for unlimited periods of time, or as we try to contain uh, displaced people in poorer parts of the world, uh, spending billions of dollars. Um, various scholars talk about how Australia's border or America's border or Europe's border is a long, long way from the territorial edge of those countries or, or that uh, community, the EU. The, the borders reach far into the Middle East, into Africa, into Asia, because we spend billions of dollars ensuring that those who we don't want to have to live with don't get close to our countries. So in a sense, uh, we're, we behave like the priest and the Levite. But I'd go even further than that, and we we deal with this in a couple of points in the book, suggesting that if we think about it seriously, I think our states behave and be, and have behaved like the robbers at various times, including right now, in the sense of contributing to the, the creation of conditions of instability and vulnerability in other parts of the world that lead to crises that generate displacement. So the very people who we are refusing to grant refuge to, we are culpable in one way or another for their displacement through, um, we can think historically, the, um, the enormous uh, acquisition of land and wealth of uh, former settler colonies such as Australia, Canada, the US, at the expense and at the displacement and often the, the extermination of native peoples or other peoples um, and the, uh, the fact that those historical processes, imperial processes, colonial processes have left us in a position of power and wealth and comfort and other parts of the world in positions of ongoing, sustained uh, poverty and instability. And even in the post-colonial era, we've established economic practices, trade practices, etc., to sustain this system of inequality. You can think to, to the foolish, reckless, illegal wars that Western states have waged in recent decades that have uh, created the um, instabilities in other parts of the world that either at the time of those wars or in the decades or years since have generated further crises. Think of the mess that is the Middle East now, for which surely Western states bear some responsibility. Um, uh, the Syrian civil war in part being um, caused by the instability in Syria, caused in part by the displacement of a million Iraqis into Syria after the Iraq war. Um, and now we have Syria, a population of 23 million or so, where more than 11 million are displaced. Um, there's a sense in which we have acted as the robbers and therefore, as we say in the book, it is deeply problematic for us to ever be thinking of what we might give or grant to displaced people in terms of charity or generosity or benevolence or our discretionary love. I think it's a matter of reparations and justice and, um, yeah, uh, repentance even for the harms that we've done. Wow. What a, what a beautiful way that you explain the good Samaritan. So I see myself like in that priest Levite situation of like not looking, not wanting to acknowledge. And so that's a, like a powerful illustration and also recognizing our privilege in so many ways of not even wanting to address it. Also like in this day and age where there's so much information out there about like you just mentioned a whole and people that are displaced. And I think what's hard sometimes is like knowing, and I know that you get to this at the end of your book in ways that we can begin to take steps. And I, I want to get to that with you, but um, 
you know, you just went through talking about the individual, like individually, like our responsibility to care for the vulnerable, to care for the displaced. We see the examples in, in the Old Testament. You highlighted the examples in the New Testament, especially with Christ. So we see that. We see those ethics there. In your second part of the book, you move into like how the church's mission should be impacted by this ethic. And I wonder if you maybe you can share a little bit about the responsibility of the church. So not just the people individually, but like the actual church kind of looking at these situ looking at the situation of refugees and immigrants and the role of the church to um, extend kinship. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I mean, one way we could look at this is through the lens of mission, through the lens of missiology. And I think um, a right definition of mission is really important. We need to understand that the arc, the narrative arc of the biblical story is a missional arc of God back in Genesis 3 in light of the fall, setting out on this long road of recovering God, the divine purposes for the creation. And from the calling of Israel, Genesis 12, 1 to 3, all the, all the way to the Great Commission, Matthew 28 and beyond, forming a people, calling a people, shaping a people to live as a sign to God's restoring reign in Christ. And we live as a sign to this restorative reign uh, in life, word, and deed, because this is, the, the gospel is a gospel of the recovery of the divine purposes in Christ for the creation. And it, it certainly includes substitutionary atonement. It certainly includes reconciliation between God and humankind. But it's the story from the beginning to end is also about the whole of the creation. And so mission is us in life, word and deed, bearing witness to the tenderness of God in Christ and what God is busy doing. This is my father's world and broken and corrupted. It may be and it is. But in Christ, God is busy recovering this, the, the beautiful divine purposes for the creation. And so in, in this situation of forced displacement, um, say, for, if I may, just for Western churches for now, particularly as Luke has outlined so well, giving our complicity in producing the forced displacement, it's very important for the church, if, we, if we're to hold out the word of life aright, to really uh, embody Jesus' tenderness in this regard and to find creative ways to speak and to do um, with our hands and with our heart, to respond in a way that mirrors God's gracious tender heart. We don't do that because it's charity. We do that because they're our kin, they're our fellow human beings, because biblical ethics always tilts towards vulnerability, and as Luke said, because of our historical and current complicity in the in the forced displacement of many people who might be trying and hoping to get into the US or Canada or Australia or the UK. And so I think we have to think very creatively. I mean, let's go to the US, for example. Some churches in the US will be in states where refugees are settled, for example. Some churches are in border states. Luke and I have many friends in Arizona, for example, where I sometimes go down and teach. And in such places, uh, we can be active ourselves, and we can befriend, and we can be supporting newcomers to the country, uh, whether immigrants, documented or undocumented, or, or whether people who are being resettled through the refugee program, particularly now Biden has made this wonderful promise of 120 refugees uh, per year, uh, 120,000 rather. And so we can put that into practice in an embodied way. Other things we can do is we can inform ourselves. If we're not in such states, if we're in places where uh, this may not be up close and personal, we might think this is a pressing issue for the church given the US political climate. And frankly, Mike and Luke, given the Australian climate regarding refugee welcome. And we might start a reading group. You might, well, if I may, by uh, get your hands on refuge, reimagine, and and just see who wants to who wants to think through these e issues uh, very very closely, and who wants to dive deeply into scripture and think about the political realities and see that some of the limitations and the fears are fictional and politicized, and actually that this beautiful welcome that is unfolded in scripture for us uh, is is very realistic, and indeed we're responsible to hold it. Then, Mike, you know, so we can we can inform ourselves and we can be involved politically and we can educate. And if we're fortunate, we can actually get involved personally. But, Mike, sometimes I think that that when we understand the tenderness of Christ, the tenderness of God in Christ that we see throughout the biblical story, sometimes we don't have to find these cutting edge issues like, 
you know, a, a forcibly displaced person who's been relocated to my suburb and befriending them. Sometimes we just have to find the most appropriate way for me to live out of that tenderness. You know, is there a lonely person uh, at, at our local school? Is there a, lo- a lonely family on our street? What what ways is the brokenness of the world reflected in my local neighborhood? And and how can, by engaging in that brokenness, how can this could be a mutual thing where we all grow and where I grow? But I do think, yeah. man, you know, in this post-Christian moment, Mike, it is so important that the church isn't just speaking, but we're doing. You know, post-Christendom is upon us. In Vancouver, it's thoroughly upon us. But it's there in U.S. cities as well, for sure. The church no longer rules the waves. And we need to embody the tenderness of Christ if our words about Christ are to be heard. Amen. You mentioned um, some of the fears, and I think that's sometimes what holds us back. And sometimes the resistance is because of some of the fears which is sometimes the reason why people are maybe even Christian people are opposed to certain immigration policies or allowing more immigrants into the country. Sadly, can you address maybe some of the fears that you hear um, that are maybe in opposition to the biblical kinship that you're arguing in this book? I think, um, as you say, there's different types of fears. There's different sources of fear, economic fears, uh, fears of uh, security. Um, and just cultural fears as well, fear of loss of national bonds and national identity. I think the first two can be quite quickly dismissed, but not in a dismissive way, if that makes sense. Um, In terms of the security uh, issue, the the fear is often that refugees, this is often expressed in in surveys, et cetera, that refugees uh, bring them with them criminality or a tendency to terrorism or, or, or a desire to undertake terrorist activities. And the social scientific research um, suggests that these fears are vastly overstated. So in the um, in the American context, for example, uh, immigrants, refugees or otherwise, tend to have lower rates of criminality than native-born citizens in the US, lower rates of incarceration, um, and the threat uh, that a refugee will undertake a terrorist attack is almost zero. Um, I think the, what one recent study I saw said that since the US established its refugee program in 1980, there have only been two instances, two examples of refugees who have been caught planning a terrorist attack, and even those were planning to undertake the attack outside the borders of the United States. So it's basically zero. These Those who are granted refuge are incredibly well vetted by U.S. security services. Um, very minimal security threat. In terms of economics, again, in terms of um, the U.S. nation as a whole, immigration and including refugees bring net economic benefits. A study that was suppressed by the Trump administration a couple of years ago but was then leaked to the press found that, well, yes, refugees tend to rely on social security services to a larger extent than native-born citizens in their first few years of arrival, which makes sense. Uh, But over the course of their lives, their working lives, they bring an enormous net economic benefit to the United States. Um, And uh, someone might push back and say, well, yes, but I know someone who lost their job or I know someone who, because of the inflow of immigrants, into their community uh, pushed, that had the effect of pushing down wages. I think um, the study seems to suggest that, well, yes, that has happened, that continues to happen in individual situations, um, but uh, overall inflow of immigrants into communities, into states, into the US as a whole, tends to push up wages, tends to provide additional jobs, um, and really it's a matter of managing the economic effects of um, immigration well. And I think the the sad thing is that politicians have have made a lot of hay out of putting immigrate recent immigrants in opposition to other poor or lower class um, workers in American society. And this this isn't just limited to the U.S. It happens in Australia too. No doubt it happens elsewhere. And they they they, they do this in a perverse way. 
that doesn't reflect the um, social scientific realities of these economic effects of immigration. In terms of culture and identity, that's a, I suppose, in one way, a more complex thing to think through. So, so the criticism often made is that if a country welcomes too many immigrants uh, who are of a different nationality, then our na national identity will be diluted or weakened or perverted even in some way. A few responses to this, several really. One is that um, I think we need to be aware that the way those making those national identity arguments make the argument tends to rely on a very sanitized version of their nation's identity, one that obscures the historical generation of that identity. So you can think again of Australia, Canada and the US and think of how those uh, majority peoples who today claim to be the, uh, the those who get to define the national identity arrived and stole the land of other peoples, excluded them or even exterminated them often, and then uh, put up bars to immigration um, throughout the 19th century. Think of the, uh, the anti-Chinese Immigration Act within the US and also within Canada. Uh, think of the White Australia policy within Australia, which was still in place until the 1970s, and made exceptions to that for economic reasons when they wanted to rely on the labour of immigrants, and as soon as they didn't want to, they would exclude them again. It's a deeply racist history, this construction of our national identity. So it's a bit rich, I suppose, um, and, mm. and sad, really, to be suggesting today that in order to preserve this national identity, we need to again exclude outsiders, particularly outsiders in need. And a counterpoint to that, which I think really reveals the hypocrisy, is that so many Western states have these programs for fast track to immigration, fast track to citizenship for outsiders who are wealthy, who are going to bring investment and bring their business. And, and various countries have a specific fee. You, you pay 600,000 euros to a particular country within the EU and you get citizenship within 12 months. Mm -hmm. That tells us a lot about the true, the true identity of these states, um, that it's, it's not about preserving a, yes, a, a, an innocent national identity. It's about generating wealth and excluding those that we don't like. And that's not a uh, biblical way to think about community. As, as we argue in the book, we get from the model of Israel in the Old Testament, God's design and desire for community, which is that whatever else a national community is going to be about, it's got to be about welcoming the stranger as well. And insofar as it's uh, not about that, the nation needs to be working to reconstruct its understanding of itself and its purposes um, to, to do justice for the stranger. That's beautiful. And I can't believe we're already up in our hour. Um, your book does so much to not only address this biblical ethic of kinship, how it relates to us personally, how it provides us mission for our churches. But then you get into further on in more detail into a political theology of national community and then further the global responsibility, which I know we don't have time to get into. Um, but you've done a fantastic job like listing everything out, starting with the biblical basis of why this is important for Christians to be concerned about displaced people and our responsibility to care for the vulnerable, uh, to mirror Christ in that way. And then the mission of the church and then looking at nations and um, nations responsibility to follow this biblical ethic as well. And then you go into more detail on the globe to kind of close up. You have a beautiful section that I think everyone needs to be reading at the end of your book that you call the title of the chapter is creative kinship where you describe some steps that we can all take as, as you've been talking about Mark and Luke that it's not just about getting these ideas in our head and like understanding like oh yeah I need to be caring for displaced people um, it's more than that it's like what actions are we taking and that's really you have a call to action at the end of the book on things we all can be doing to uh, be part of this mission. And I was wondering maybe if you, can, if you can share a little bit about some of those actions we can take. And also um, maybe even share the, the prayer, because I love that you talk about the Jesus prayer 
and how you can use that in, with our concern and praying for those who are refugees or those who are displaced. Thanks, Michael. Um, we think that it's time in this post-Christendom moment for the church to rediscover Jesus' way, to rediscover Jesus' way in Scripture. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, for sure, but throughout Scripture, in some of the ways that we've been speaking about today. It seems to me that this is something that a lot of Christians, millennials, Generation Xs, baby boomers, many, many Christians are longing for, a deeper way that's tender and shows the beauty of Christ. And so our encouragement is to is for us to find those small groups of people uh, or, if we're able, even to nourish a whole church community, to read Scripture afresh, finding those resources that unfold Scripture in these ways. We have this book, Refuge Reimagined. I have another book, if I may, uh, that is about uh, the book of Exodus, God's, it's called God's Family. Just to, to start to understand the biblical story afresh as with this missional arc of God recovering all things in Christ, and then as a community living in a particular neighborhood to find ways in life, word, and deed to incarnate and embody and to display the tenderness of Christ in the way we speak, in the way we live, in the way we respond to refugee issues and immigration issues, in the way we learn, in what we give our attention to. And I do think that prayer is a very important part, Mike. I do think that slowing down and seeking the silences of, with God is very important uh, for, for us as individuals, but also to be contrastive, intentional communities living into Christ's way and discerning Christ's call on us. And you mentioned the Jesus Prayer. The Jesus Prayer is many, many centuries old, and there's various versions of it. But the version of it that I pray most days is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. And what's significant in Christian tradition is that prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy, it lists, it uses five precious names for Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy. And in Christian tradition, we can pray that prayer repetitively. In some monasteries, it was prayed literally 100 times before sleep. And that's one way of beginning to pray without ceasing through the day because it's just on our mind and, and in our heart. And then having prayed it a number of times, we're often invited to just to center our thoughts for two, three, even 10 minutes on one of those precious names to choose one of those precious names for Jesus to center our thoughts on and and just to give our focus to Jesus in that way, what's sometimes called centering prayer. But I think that, I mean, one way, one of those words, Lord Jesus Christ, I sometimes think of the word Christ and center on, on that. And when I think of the word Christ, of course, it's Messiah, Jesus as the King. And when I think of the word Christ, my mind and my heart goes to that beautiful arc of the biblical story that God now at last in Christ is sending the Son of God to be what God had always called God's people to be, ancient Israel, and now at last in Christ God is recovering the power of the resurrection, God's purposes for the creation, his purposes of tenderness and healing, and calling a people, calling us to display that to the world. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mark and Luke, for coming on the show to talk about your latest book and explaining to us this biblical ethic of kinship and how all of us can take part in being part of this mission. So thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks for having Mark. us, Thanks Mark. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video clip from the Dogato podcast. To get more videos like this, simply subscribe here on YouTube. You can also download the full episode of each show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or your favorite podcast player. Take care.